Hey everybody, Ben Nelson, the Everyday Real Estate Investor here. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the podcast. I am excited because I have a whole bunch of guests lined up that I'm excited to uh, to have them share their stories. And we're starting with uh, today with Brad Shepard, uh, Managing Partner at Sugar House Investments. Uh, Brad, thanks so much for being here. Hey, thanks a lot, Ben. I'm excited to visit with you today. Awesome. Thanks again. Um, yeah, why don't we start out... Um, just to give people an idea of who you are and kind of your background, share a little bit about uh, your your background in real estate, kind of where you started, what got you first interested in real estate, um, so we kind of have that context going into our conversation. Okay, sounds good. I'll try to condense it. Um, I, I've been in real, real estate for a couple of decades now, but I'll give you the short story, and then if you uh, anything sounds interesting, we can. I'm, I'm happy to dive deeper. But yeah, I actually I, in college I did a finance degree with the intention to go into commercial real estate. I don't, I, I can't remember what was the original genesis of the idea of real estate being the path I wanted to take. It might have been a high school business class, or hearing that you know more millionaires are made with real estate than any other pathway, or I don't know somewhere I got the idea. Um, but uh, I, I did my my junior after my junior year, I did an internship with a commercial real estate firm up in Seattle. Came back to my senior year and I joined a little startup and I ended up staying there for the next nine years. So I, I went a completely different path. But even with that little company, we were doing um, some cool stuff in, in, in real estate, including uh, some hospitality ho homes that we were fixing up and renting out as short term rentals back before there was even an air, such thing as an Airbnb. Yeah, before, before it was a, the, like the cool thing to do, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And we had a, a model that worked for us because we were in a, a trusted community that we were able to do these even long distance across the country. Um, we built a hotel and, a, and some retail space. So we were doing some fun things. And then I also had my own little portfolio of rental properties. Um, this whole, that, during that period, I was living in Utah where I'm originally from. 2011, my wife and I decided to move to Texas. We went to Austin. And there I continued to learn and, and about the markets there, picked up some more rentals, started doing some fix and flips, wholesaling a few deals, um, and then realized, I'm, I'm, I, this isn't what I want to do. I don't like working with the contractors and picking out color, you know, paint colors <laughs> and paint carpets and tiles. And it's not the thing that I enjoy. I want to get back to commercial. How do I, how do I do that? Um, so yeah, I started looking at the idea of being a, a general partner and talking to commercial brokers. And along that way, I got exposed to the idea of being the money guy for commercial deals. Um, and so uh, for, for me, that felt like I could do, you know, that fit me really well with my skill set and my interests. So since 2017, I focused on raising capital for, the, for commercial syndications. And that's what I've been doing since. I still have a handful of rentals, but I'm actually down to two properties now of rent, you know, rental properties at seven units between the two, two properties. But I sold off most of them to focus on, uh, to put that money into their syndications and just kept the ones that were easy to keep. And, um, I, you know, now I'm almost exclusively focused on the capital raising. Awesome. Well, I think that's so I talk a lot about, um, you know, you, you kind of have to hone in on what you are going to do in, in real estate, because there are so many ways that you can go about real estate. And it's right. great, but it's also like almost a curse, right? Uh, because you can, I, you know, I hear, what are you looking for? What are you doing in real estate? Oh, I do anything. I do wholesaling and I do this and all that. And it's like, so you're not going to be successful or as, as successful as you could be doing, trying to do quote unquote everything. Right. Um, but Absolutely. at the same time, you kind of have to like, as you're figuring out where you want to be in the space, you do have to try it, uh, you know, kiss a few frogs, right. Try a few things. You wouldn't have known that you hated doing that, uh, you know, picking out paint colors and stuff unless you tried it. So <laughs> I think that's right. a great example of, of you know kind of going through that process and figuring out your place in the real estate investment space by doing some things that hey i'm glad i did them but this wasn't really a fit and, and it actually gave you some capital to do what you're doing now um but yeah you, you had to figure that out through the process so right yep yeah you're, you're exactly right so a blessing and a curse of the real estate industry there are so many paths you can take uh, and and so you know it's it's fun to see the ones on TV where they do these incredible re remodel jobs and it's exciting. Um, I, you know, it took me I don't know what was 15, 16 years to f find where I felt like 
oh, this is where I want to be. This is perfect. Landlording was really beneficial to me and my family. That that you know we 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 benefited from years and years of equity growth and the cash flow. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did well with most of our flips. We had a couple that didn't go, go so great, but we, you know, by and large, we were able to make good money from those that we were then able to put into these syndications. And these syndications do require the ability to write some bigger checks. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without the, all the other activities that I did. But for me, I, you know, I, I, I wish I would have gotten into the commercial, you know, the commercial syndication space sooner. I, it would have saved me some pains and some headaches. Um, but it, it's and I, but we still we still see that in the commercial space. You know, folks who have been focused on one market or one asset class, the the last year things have gotten a little weird. That the transaction volume is way down, and all mm-hmm. of a sudden we're seeing somebody go from multifamily to build to rent properties, or or um, you know change change the geographic focus or whatnot. Uh, it's, there's always the opportunity to, to you get tempted by a shiny nickel or you know have that squirrel yep. syndrome like oh over here. So yeah, it never I totally goes agree. away. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'd say two things. I'd say, uh, um, you know, you also have the benefit of, yeah, it took you that time to figure out, you know, where you wanted to be, but that also is part of your track record, right? You can, you know, you can raise capital a little bit easier if you say, hey, I've this, uh, this is what I've done myself and you're vetting, but like, and this is how I know if it's a good deal be, because I have experience doing similar deals, right? That, that exactly. helps you with being able to help your investors. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, it just, oh, and I was going to also say, so it's funny because I, uh, I just did a, an episode, a monologue episode, a couple, a couple, uh, episodes ago about shiny object syndrome, I call it. And we're, right. you know, that's exactly it. It's like, you can, you can chase one thing or not. And it's like, you, you, people have a hard time focusing in on what's, you know, it's again, it's great that there's so many different opportunities, but you, you kind of got to, you, you got to hone in eventually and figure out where you want to, where you want to focus, or you're just constantly going to be chasing that next strategy, that next hot, um, you know, asset class. And, and you can do that strategically, but a lot of people just do it because they're doing them emotionally, not strategically. Right. Right. Yes. And that strategic part is so important because you might have to shift some things, right? Maybe, you know, for a, a, a a real estate agent in 2008 and nine, they had to get you know, the, the ones that succeeded and stayed in the game. They figured out short sales. That was new for most people. Yeah. Other yeah. people who couldn't learn, you know, left the industry. Um, yeah. And so sometimes you do have to adjust strategically, but this Absolutely. adding another tool in your tool belt in an area that you want to, you know, that you're focused in as opposed to, well, I was going to be a buyer rep, but now I want to go do leasing or, 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 you know, change that, you know, it's, you know, changing the strategy altogether. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it is good to get some exposure to different things, but that can also be a detriment to, to long-term success for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. No, and you hit the nail on the head and, and we'll get into that here in a little bit as far as the, the market changes and, and things like that. But yeah, if you can't adapt, if you can't adjust, uh, then you're, you know, you might do well for a time, but you know, if, when the winds change, um, you're going to be struggling if you're, if you're right. a one trick pony. Right. So exactly. Um, right. Okay, so you led you you uh, led you down this road to doing syndications, raising capital. We were talking before we got on the show here about um, your choice to go become a licensed uh, securities broker and how yeah. that fits into that. Can you? I would love you, for you to share that and why you made that decision. What made you um, go down that path within the the world of syndication? Because there's a lot of ways you can structure it. There's a lot of ways you can be involved, and this is a uh, kind of a different way of going about doing it right so right yeah I, I you know when i started raising capital in 2017 i i so i invested as a limited partner passively on a couple of deals i wanted to understand how these things worked a little bit more and, and learned a little bit more of the operations and the due diligence and then i felt okay i, I this is awesome i i like this i want to go start telling you know my associates not necessarily friends and family but people i had associated with in the real estate world uh, about it and um found some good success right out, right right out of the gate Turned out that raising capital was pretty popular. Um, I think maybe 2017, 18, 19 was kind of where it started uh, maybe mm-hmm. taking off. But originally, you know, we, we wanted to do everything by the book. So I had my securities attorneys looking at, you know, my structure with the operators, how we ma- structured that relationship. Because you cannot, the average individual out there cannot be paid as 
a, a, you know, a percentage of dollars raised, a pay for performance type of a relationship. You have to be really careful with that. Um, that's where it turns into it's under the domain of the SEC and FINRA. And, and so we had to get, you know, structure our relationships with the operators in such a way that we had some type of a meaningful role in the GP, in the general partnership. You know, we're yeah. part of the due diligence process. We're part of investor relations. We're part of the marketing efforts, et cetera. At the end of the day, though, we our compensation um, would be tied to performance. You know, we'd ha- if, if, if we failed on one deal, we'd kind of make it up on the, we'd have to make it up on the next deal. Um, and so we, we were trying to play above, above board and our attorneys had said, yeah, that worked. But uh, 2020, it was, I think it was right as things were getting starting to get a little bit weird with COVID. Um, m- many, if not most of the capital raisers in this space got letters from the SEC basically saying, Hey, we're not we're not bringing any action right now, but just know we're aware of you. We're not yeah, super happy with your model, and <laughs> yeah. do not destroy any documents. And so, I mean, when you get a letter from the SEC to your home, it's a oh boy, <laughs> type yeah. of yeah. <laughs> or not some stronger language. At least you take another look and really make sure that you're yes. doing things right, right? Yep. Yeah. And and so the timing was actually okay because things really slowed down with those first you know those first few months of COVID. So it gave us a chance to pull back and say, whoa, okay, how, what's the best way to structure this? in a way that we don't have to worry about, you know, getting on the, in, on the bad side of the SEC. That's not what I'm in this for. I have, I, you know, yeah. I've got little kids, I've got my family. I don't, I'm not, I have, I'm not interested in jail time. Right. Like, right. You know, large <laughs> fines. Um, so what, what is the best way we can do this? Um, others chose to go full in on that co GP model where they're really part of the G, the general partnership in a meaningful way and, 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 and get rid of any pay for performance type of structure. Uh, others and me, myself included chose to go the broker dealer route where went and had to get some securities licenses, find a broker dealer that we could hang our licenses with. So the broker dealer sponsors me, um, has a compliance team that makes sure everything that I do and say and put out there to my folks is compliant, meaning no outlandish promises, no guarantees, no projections uh, or you know appropriate projections. Um, all those, all the caveats that you have to do, um, make yeah. sure the, you know, the, the investors and you know, all, yes, yeah, all, all the disclosures, stuff, yeah. making sure the investors' best interests are are, are are front and center. And so it's a it, it's it's a little bit painful because I've got every, everything I do. The compliance team has to sign off, and I have to pay my monthly fees to the broker dealer, and they take a cut of my income. Um, so it's it, 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 it you know, definitely some hoops, and there's some pain to it. Um, but at the end of the day, it puts me what I think is in a, in a more trusted position with the investors, a really clean relationship with the operators and peace of mind that at the end of the day, mm-hmm. uh, I'm, yeah. I'm staying home <laughs> to be able to hang yeah. out with my kids. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's probably the most important part, but yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, and that's, and that's really interesting. Cause like you said, there's some people that went, okay, there, there's multiple choices there, right? You could either do, Say okay, we really need to make sure we're actually, you know, involved in this deal as a general partner, and we're not just, you know, on paper we're a general partner, but we're really not doing anything but raising capital. Because you know, there's there's a lot of people walking that line, right. you know. Yeah. yeah, we're we're general partners, but really all we're doing is we're bringing the money to the table, and and so you know, it's like okay, you can either shift and say, well, I guess we're just going to be more involved in our projects, or you can say, you know. No, my my best role is still to raise capital. How do I do that in a way that I'm protected and that the investors are protected and, and that I'm compliant? Um, right. And so you totally you went the licensed uh, secure, securities uh, dealer uh, route, um, which is I think you know we again we talked about honing in right. So you have to look yeah. at okay, it, what's making that decision? Is it in my benefit to be? more involved in the deal, or is that just going to distract me from what I'm really right. good at? Right. You, so. You're, you're exactly, you're exactly right. It, so the, 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 the licensed securities route securities broker route makes my day to day really, really clean. I, you know, I, I, I've got regular conversations with my operators. We're looking at their deals. We're talking about how things are going, but I've got no involvement in the management of the managers you know, the, the day-to-day stuff, the, the relationship with the lender, no involvement with that whatsoever. So my primary focus is really just on the investors. The the, the third option that people could take in, in, in my industry, in my role, the capital raising role was the fund of funds route, where you'd actually start your own fund 
Oh yeah. And then have investors pool money into that. And then you, you would go place it with these general partnership partnerships the, in these syndication deals. Um, and that was his, his worked well for some, you have to be able to raise quite a bit of money. There's, you have to be able to stomach all the fees that come from setting up your own fund. And so mm-hmm. the investors can take a little bit of a hit, um, because those fees get passed through. Not always, uh, not always the, 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 the fund owner might choose to just absorb those. Um, but you know, now you've got all the, that responsibility of, of dealing with the lawyers and, uh, and, and, and managing that fund on top of it as, as well. And it mm-hmm. ends up being a little bit of a, you know, by and large, um, some blind funds, um, where the investors might not know exactly where you're going to go place that right. money ahead yep. of time. Yep. So, you know, it's, yep. it, it, it does, it can, that's, I'm not saying it always does, but it can complicate things a little bit more where yeah. again, with my, in my, the, the route I chose to go, I, I my, my focus it all, all the time is, we're talking to educating spending time with my investors and you're matching investors to specific deals for the for them then yeah, exactly yeah. yeah so that's how you know we've got the relationships already with the operators and that the, the you know my my broker dealer has to get involved in that right make you know they structure the deal and make sure all the agreements are in place and buttoned up and then from there um we, when that operator has a deal where they need help raising capital for we do our due diligence on that deal specifically again so we've already done the diligence on the operator now we do it at the deal level and if all that passes muster then i can take that deal out that specific deal out to my investors and say hey guys and gals everybody we've got this deal here here's the market here's the operator here's what we why we like it here's what's going on in that in that geography and if this interests you let me know and that's so it's a really easy position for the investors they know exactly which deal we're talking about if they find something that's interesting they just raise their hand i send them the full info packet and if they want to move forward, I help them from there. If they don't, cool. They had a chance to check it out, um, that specific deal. But yeah, very uh, deal by deal specific opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Which to your point, you know, a fund, um, you know, number one, you got a lot. You got to make sure that capital is always at work, right? So you've got right. you've got to place it, um, or there's pressure to place it. Um, versus, yes. you know, these are, uh, you know, it's timed when it makes sense for the deals available. The investor has money, and then they get to know exactly what they're investing in versus a general and, and blind funds can work. People do them. Um, you sure have to have a track record and, um, you know, proof of performance in the past to be able to, to, to sell. I mean, for the most part, unless you have really, really trusting investors, um, right. you gotta be able to show why, why, why should I put my money in your fund without, uh, even knowing what you're going to buy. Right. So, um, yep. that's a, that's a challenge too. Yeah. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit if you're if you don't mind we don't have to talk about specific operators but um just kind of what you're seeing out there just the you you we talked about it earlier kind of alluded to the market the changes um so let's dive into like deals and and opportunities and the market in general and some of those things if if you don't mind doing that sure yeah um, okay. it, it's been it's been an interesting time for sure as you know the interest rate environment changed deal transact you know deal the 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 deal volume pulled way back. Um, some of our operators have been pretty quiet. Um, others have been able to can shift strategy a little bit and again, staying within their lane, but shift, shift strategy slightly to be able to continue to produce vol- deals, deals that make really good sense. And they're, they're still yeah. really exciting to our investors. Um, the, uh, one, one thing we learned in uh, that we were, we were a little bit, sh- light on in our due diligence check processes was within the operator team. We, um, we, um, you know, of, of, of the seven operators we partner with six have had, had really good team members who understood the, the, their financing components in and out. We had one operator who didn't have anybody on their team who fully understood in depth, nitty gritty details of their loan documents. And that came to bite them in the butt and us in the butt um, five ish months ago in, in is that their lender was basically forcing them to either refinance or sell the property. And it came down to their team was not as strong on that, that financing side mm-hmm. as we thought they were. Uh, so that we, from, we learned some lessons there as far as some more things that we needed to add to our due diligence processes to make sure we've got those bases covered. Um, we haven't had to do any capital calls. Um, haven't gotten close to that. We have had some deals where the deal specifically paused distributions 
just to be really conservative with cash. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of the cash flows have been impacted as interest rates did reset um, and impacted cash flow. Um, but it's it, maybe more important than ever. You want operators with deep pockets. Um, yeah. It's the ones yeah. without deep pockets have had to go back out to their investors and have struggled in this environment. Um, we, we've done well working with investor groups or operator groups that we've identified early on. Maybe, you know, like, um, I can drop a couple of names. Like uh, we started working with Ashcroft Capital on their third deal and, and Rise Capital on their second deal. So we've been good at finding really solid operators early on. Um, but at this point, those are really solid teams who have deep pockets and have really sophisticated systems. And then as the interest rate environment got a little goofy, we've been able to what they have been able to weather the storm well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and there's one, one little nuance there that I want to just, just for maybe people that aren't super uh, up on the differences between like residential and, and commercial an interest rate environment change affects commercial loans a lot differently than residential and residential. It's like, well, okay. You know, well, I'll just hold on to it. Right. No big right. deal. I got to lock it for 30 years. Like, All good. Yeah. Yeah does not work that way in the commercial world. You're, uh, you could, uh, you could very much find yourself, uh, you know, most loans are variable rate or become a variable rate. You know, they might be fixed for a short term, um, but then they're going to, they're going to adjust. Um, right. and, or, or, or have a balloon or, or, you know, one or the other, right? So you, you are forced in this position. And, and so you really have to know and, and no is probably not the right word because nobody has that crystal ball, but you really have to be, cognizant of, of where markets are headed because, um, you know, you, you don't want to back yourself into a corner where it's like you have to sell or you get your, your interest rate resets and now your cash flow is completely changed. Now, I don't think anybody saw rates going from where they were to where they are now so quickly. Um, so that's kind of hard to predict, but right. um, it just was, a little it was nuance fast. there. Yeah, it was very, it was very quick. I mean, it was over. I mean, it was last year over between what February and and like May or June, right? You know, interest rates almost you know doubled. So, um, but yeah, that stuff's hard to predict. That big of a swing, um, right? But yeah, there's a lot of operators to your point that are in a spot. Um, they were planning on riding out those low interest rates, or there was a lot of, you know, maybe less experienced operators. I don't want to say speculating, but speculating a little bit, right? On on rent growth. And, you know, we were right. seeing huge rent growths and low interest rates for 10 years. It's like, you know, newer operators that haven't seen market cycles um, are making, we're making a lot of assumptions. The, the the last 10 years, I mean, you couldn't not make money in, in, in real estate. And, and ironically, I've seen, I've seen people not make money. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, okay. I'll keep that right <laughs> Which is kind of um, crazy, but yeah. But the values were going up so fast. The rental increases were going up quickly. And then that party stopped. And yeah. when rents, when, when, when people went in with a business plan saying, I'm going to go, you know, put in all these upgrades and that, that's going to allow me to increase the rents here, 200 or $300 a unit, what have you. And then you couldn't accomplish that because all of a sudden people, you know, there were layoffs, people weren't moving to that city in the numbers. We thought that that cash flow was significantly impacted. Mm -hmm. And then on the, on the bank side, they're always looking at the banks are getting, you know, uh, regular financial statements so they can see what's going on with the property. And if they're starting to see cash flow is suffering and then, you know, because of a variable interest rate, uh, the, the debt service has come up. And now that that loan doesn't look so good. Um, yeah. So yeah. DSCR is a term that um, is tossed around a lot in the commercial space, debt service coverage ratio. If that ratio gets out of whack, now the, now the lender's going to come and say, hey, guys, it's, it's not yeah, like you, know, you, you had a five-year balloon or you had a 10-year balloon or you had something. But the minute you get out of whack with that ratio, they have the right to come accelerate the loan. And if you're not in a position to pay it off or refinance it, or, you know, you're gonna have to sell. Yeah, and how do you refinance um, it when that loan was, you know, three and a half percent or 4% and now it's seven, right? Seven exactly, and half, exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. the teams have to be really good at managing, you know, understanding their loan covenants very, very well, managing that cash flow very, very well, make, being spot on on their rent growth projections as close yeah. as you can, again, because you're predicting some, right? You're making some best guesses, but you have to be really good at those best guesses. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, otherwise, those things can come by two. And it's by. hard. It's hard when it's a competitive environment and you're trying to be conservative, but you also don't want to be so conservative that you're you're you know missing out on every deal, right? So, right. Um, and I think yeah, I mean there was a lot of that, and I think people were 
um, you know, they were looking at future growth and all that stuff. And that's how people were justifying deals was, was right. with that. And I think some of those folks are finding themselves um, in trouble. To your point, the ones and that are better positioned uh, financially are, are able to ride out that storm. But um, and, and that's where we're at now. The deals that we've been doing this year uh, for probably the last six months have been they've come at a discount, um, yeah. pretty, pretty significant discount from the peak a year ago because you know, these 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 are operator groups that needed to sell quickly because of looming uh, financial trouble. Um, yeah. And yeah. so we were able to go in there or, or our operator partners were able to go in there and get a really good deal on that yeah. property. And that's, you know, that, that's that, those are kind of deals that we're going out there to our investors with. They, yeah, hey, people may be getting, that. getting bridge loans right. and stuff uh, over the last couple, you know, a couple of years, those are coming due and exactly. um, or even just variable rate loans, right? A lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so we've been yeah. picking them up at a good price and now that number works, it, even in yeah. the current interest rate environment, it, that number works and we can go forward yeah, and from I there. Think, and I think that that's where, and we talk about this in one of our local investment groups, um, you know, in, in the Portland market where I'm in, um, here in Portland, Oregon, the you, you had said something about the volume being way down and here, I mean, I don't know every other market where they're at, but I know Portland uh, 2022 or 2021 uh, was, there was a lot of sales volume, lots of it. 2022, uh, it was about half of what 2021 was. And then this year we're on track to do about, I think we're 10% of what 2020 or 2022 was. Okay. Uh, you know, and we're halfway yeah. through the year. So, okay. you know, we're on track to do a fifth of what we did last year in sales volume. And that year was half of the prior year. So it's like okay. almost gone to nothing. So, and that's because I, it, that, it, that's a function of, you know, people are going to be forced into having to do something, take those losses potentially. That's how you're finding some of those deals. You, you just, you don't have a choice depending on your loan and, and your situation. Um, but there are a lot of people that, you know, maybe would have sold um, long-term owners, things like that, where it's like, you know, I don't have to sell. It doesn't make sense to sell. Uh, buyers are, you know, obviously numbers make totally different sense at 7% interest rates than at three and a half. So you can't, these numbers are not in alignment is my, is my point where seller expectations on what they're willing to take. Um, if they don't have to sell, don't line up with buyer expectations and what they're willing to pay because cash flow right. is not there and rent growth has not stopped, but it's not out of control like it was for, for several years in, in most markets, right? We're back down to normal rent growth uh, in a lot of markets. And so right. that speculative piece is out of the picture. And so now we're back trying to figure out the market almost again between right. buyers and sellers. Real fundamentals again. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. That's yes. Yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> imagine, imagine that. So, yeah, it, and you know, it's... I, I, you can't predict everything, but we knew, I mean, we all knew that you, that, that 2%, 3% interest rate, that, that world wasn't going to exist forever, right? That that was a fun party while it lasted. And I remember 2020 thinking like, I want to get as much debt as I can right now. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen money so cheap. Like, let's get, let's like, like finance everywhere. I mean, prudently, but uh, let's go get as much debt as we can uh, right. because yep. the money was just so cheap. But now, you know, we're back to, okay, this is normal. This is, you know, yeah. we have to, we're, we're thinking about normal fundamentals here. Um, two years ago, we moved to Boise from Austin and Boise had experienced a ton of growth. We've seen Boise get hit pretty hard over the last year. And mm -hmm. I think a function yeah. of that as well as, you know, a lot of folks that came, they came from high priced, high income areas like Seattle, Portland, California. Layoffs happened. And if you moved, you know, you got, you moved to Boise, you got laid off from your Bay Area tech company. Um, you're not finding a $500,000 salary here in Boise, right? It just doesn't right, happen. Yeah. And so, yeah. and then some companies say, well, we want you back in the office. Well, now those people are, are they might be some of the, you know, the residential sellers because they, they want to go back to the, those uh, higher income areas. Um, but they're having to sell that house here in Boise or wherever else that. Um, yeah, pretty significant. It, well, yeah. it, exactly. Because, um, you know, they want to go back for that higher income that they know they can achieve somewhere else. Um, so that remote worker scenario is, is, I think, plays in, and that's certainly you know, it's, we're, the folks who would have been more willing to go to a place like Boise or Toledo or whatever in 2020, now this giving them pause because okay, what's that? What's the what's my employer situation going to be like? Um, 
if are they going to call us back to the you know to the office? Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. The, the, that's impacted home sales. That's impacted the rental growth, uh, all, uh, you know, as, as well. So lots yeah, of different that, dynamics going on right now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I think that that's a perfect example of of you know you hear all these uh, general statements of the real estate market and what the real estate market is doing, and there's no such thing as the real estate market as the way they talk about it on on the news, right? Because you know, it, you look at um, Boise and and some of the markets and and uh, you know Nampa and some of the a lot of the uh, several Idaho markets, um, you know that really caught fire big time. Um, right. You know, for a couple of years, uh, and you have to you have to look at those fundamentals. Like, what's driving this growth? And the same thing happened back in the financial crisis, right? Um, most markets lost, uh, you know, in, during that time just because of the unique circumstances of the market, but not equally, right? Several right. markets lost 50, 60%, some lost 20%, right? So you have to look at the drivers behind it. And is this, is this permanent? Is this permanent growth? Is this temporary? And some of that is hard to predict, but some of it you can look at it and be like, okay, there's not really anything here that's substantial. Uh, right. Yep. Yeah. And, and and that's you know there's we 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 were kind of surprised by the similarities we found here in Boise to Austin where we had been for the last ten years. You know, a small little college town, a liberal town in a in a very conservative state, but that you know the college town atmosphere brings the good food and the and the and the music and the you know the art scene. Yeah. There's the the um, traffic congestion here and and not the infrastructure to support the growth. I mean, all these things that we saw experienced in Austin, we see them here, but the difference is. Austin doesn't have, you know, Oracle moving here. It doesn't have HP. It doesn't have National Instruments. It doesn't have Tesla moving here. And so the, all these folks moved here is, I, I, I would I would guess, it seems like to be, this is my theory anyway, that it was a lot of remote workers. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, now what happens um, and when, when people get called back to work and or they lose their job and looking for another, you know, a replacement of that. And so, yeah, yeah it, it is a very... Uh, I, you, when you're thinking about markets, where does it make sense to buy a residential or commercial? Looking at that real, those real fundamentals of long-term population job growth um, numbers is is key. Absolutely, yep. Even with some of those remote options, because I mean, we're we're not quite sure how that's going to play play out long-term, right? And and to your point, if people get laid off, if the, where's the job to replace it? Are they going to be able to get another remote job or is it going to have to be something local? What are their options? Are they going to have to move? Right. So, exactly. Um, well, that's this is all great stuff. I appreciate you sharing. And, and uh, you know, I think the market, um, again, I don't think we should get out the crystal ball and draw a conclusion, but I think there's opportunity in any market. Right. And to your point that you guys are finding opportunity or your operators are finding opportunity um, for your investors that you're able and you're able to place that capital. Um, it's just a matter of again, adapting and adjusting to what the market conditions are and where's the opportunity going to be so you can look in the right spot. Um, yep. So and before we let you go, though, unless you have something else to add, I wanted to, I always ask uh, for people to share a challenge or some sort of hurdle or something they had to overcome during their, I mean, if you had anything that you had to overcome at any point, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, just to, you know, Hey, everybody has hurdles. Everybody has things that they have to get through and, and it's not always easy. Right. So, um, just to remind everybody that, Hey, you're going to hit some challenges and difficulties, but it's okay. Just put, keep pushing forward. Right. Yeah. I've definitely taken my licks. Um, you know, I got, I got t enticed by numbers when, you know, living in Austin, it was hard to find deals there. I was seeing what people were doing in the Midwest. I tried to do a fix and flip from long distance from Austin on a house in Pittsburgh. Um, didn't go well. Um, I had a, a fourplex in San Antonio that on paper looked like, I mean, just killer cash flow war zone property. So the realities of yeah, that. Those paper were, cash flows are, look really good. Right. Yeah. And then the reality is, you know, the drama, the repairs, the, you know, yep. calling the police, the, oh, you know, man, one I've tenant. Been there. Wow, we can oh, do man. <laughs> so lessons learned on the war zone properties. Yep. Um, absolutely. My, my first it's deal. It's really though, annoying um, when they steal the copper for the third time, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the water heater all of a sudden just disappears. We had yeah, external yeah. water heaters and those things would just disappear on the regular. Yeah. Um, oh, just, it was just crazy. So, no thanks to that. Um, no, thank you anymore. But uh, yeah. my first actual uh, uh, passive investment on the syndication side, 
240 unit apartment complex about two hours south of Houston. And I learned on that one all the things that I did wrong. So it was a great first one for me to get involved in. Um, it was supposed to be a 12 month deal. Five years later, I still don't have my money back out of it. Uh, wow. Got wiped out by Hurricane Harvey, the new construction that was happening there. The permits were wrong. The the zoning was wrong. Um, the insurance wasn't oh adequate. Wow. Property management was, was subpar. And two hours south of Houston, it was not a high growth area um, e even back then. And so I learned all the things, <laughs> all the <laughs> things that, um, that, that are, you, you shouldn't do. Um, those are some of the lessons I can bring, you know, present to my investors up here. Okay. Here, here are what you do want to want to look for. Um, so I've definitely learned Absolutely. a lot from uh, my own pains that I That's can share. With, I, I love that group. though, because I mean, not that, not that you're in that spot and that you have to learn that lesson, <laughs> yeah. but that, I mean, that's gold to your investors, right? I mean, you're, the mistakes that I've made, the mistakes that you've made, those like hopefully people here listening to this can learn that lesson and not have to go through that themselves. But that's that's gold to your investors because you can say, hey, this is what I learned on this one. And here's and, and they're going to listen to you. But it gives you that, you know, even failures give you credibility, right? Because it's like, look, I did this this way. Don't do it this way. This is the wrong way to do it. Here's why. Right. And here's why. And here's what you're going to do instead. And this is why this is a better option. Um, yep. And because, you know, some of those deals probably have a little bit shinier numbers on them. Right. But, you know, they're also higher risk. So you got to you got to look at and not just be enticed by the the higher projected returns that could easily dwindle. Like those paper uh, pro formas, right? <laughs> yes, the paper it's pro hard formas. To hit those numbers Man, when you're so water heaters every few months. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's what I try to share with my investors. And I try to, you know, I, 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 my responsibility is to be very unbiased. Their best interests come foremost. Um, and so here's here's you know full disclosure. I get paid money if you if you put your dollars in this investment, I get paid a percentage of that. Um, so here, now let's talk. And here's why this one makes sense. And here's, you know, the things why, why I wouldn't go put my money in that deal. And so that's, you know, for my, for the operators I work with, my investors, they could go right to that operator and place money with them. Mm -hmm. Most people I work with wouldn't know how to find any operator, let alone the good operators though. And so that's yeah. what I'm trying to bring to the table is I, I, I know the good operators. I'm, I'm pretty plugged into the operator scene. I know the ones that are struggling. I know the ones that have had to do the capital calls. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know how to identify a good, op you know, a good deal within a good operator team. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to bring to the table. I've learned my lessons. Yeah. It's been, you know, I've, I've, I've taken my, you know, taken my, uh, my licks over the last 20 yeah. years, um, learn from yeah, my it's mistakes. A great, and, it's a great you know, service. Forward. I mean, really, you're just, you're, you're, you're that extra layer of due diligence. Um, you know, they should still be doing their due diligence, but, um, you know, the fact that you've already vetted these people and these deals and all that stuff. And you're, it's just, you know, there's a lot to look at when you're investing, even for savvy investors. And uh, having another set of eyes uh, underwriting a deal is not a bad thing. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Awesome. That's, uh, yeah. That's that's the message. You know, hey, with it, like, I want you to understand why this is a good deal. I want you to make this decision, but I can help guide you and help you understand why it, why it would or wouldn't be um, a good fit. And yep, yep. That's, awesome. that's the value I'm trying to deliver. Exactly. Well, if people would like to connect with you directly and talk to you a little bit about uh, maybe they're looking to... Uh, put some capital to work um, and would love to be connected to some some operators through you and, and look at some opportunities. How can they do that? Yeah, best place to connect is on our, our website, uh, sugarhouseinvestments.com. Um, if you, just, all, all you do is just uh, give us your email address there. Our deals always do um, oversubscribe. They fill up pretty quickly. And so for our repeat investors, and I'll make this offer to your invest to your listeners as well, is um, just put in the comments that you heard about us through Ben Nelson, the Everyday Real Estate Investor Show, and we'll add you to the VIP list, which means we send that out to that email list, our deals out to that list 24 hours ahead of before we send it out to the, yeah, the main list. Yep. And so awesome. yeah, can you know, give us your you know, put your email address in there? Let me know you connected to us through Ben Nelson, get you on that list so you can see those deals. Or of course, just set up a time to schedule a phone call and get to yeah. know each other a little bit better and yeah, go from there. Their goals and all that stuff. Awesome. Exactly. Yep. Great. That's awesome. Well, hey, uh, Brad, appreciate you being on the show. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for sharing what you're doing in in uh, the real estate investment space now and and how you can help investors that maybe want to invest passively and 
uh, your thoughts on the market and glad to hear you guys are finding opportunities. That's great. Fantastic. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. It was great talking with you and thanks for having me on. All right. Thanks again, Brad.